that have been made in favour of recreativity, in, in favour of uh, these various strategies, they all draw on the model of the DJ. They all draw on the idea of, um, of remixes and mashups and sampling and digging in the crates and all these sort of DJ terms. Um, and, uh, you know, like particularly in the work, in the thinking of um, Nicolas Bouriard, uh, the French uh, art critic and curator, uh, DJing, the DJ is absolutely central to his argument, as it is for, for this guy, Aram Sinreich, who wrote the book uh, Mashed Up. Um, and the DJ and the curator are kind of basically doing um, similar kind of work. They're filtering, they're editing, they're recontextualizing, they're collecting, they're annotating. I'm going to pause for a little bit uh, and play some music um, that uh, relates to some of the practices uh, that people are discussing and celebrating. And um, one of um, the, the, the figure that um, I'm going to play is uh, actually from Norway, uh, Todd Turia, and he's you know, he makes his own music, but he's also, I guess, he's most known as the king of the re-edit, this, this sort of, uh, this kind of craze for remixes that um, are, remixing kind of went out of, out of control in the 90s, and people were doing remixes that bore no relation to the original work at all, you know, in some cases just completely no trace of the, of the thing being remixed. But then in the, in the recent years, there's been this sort of, almost like a neoconservative move back to, you know, uh, remixes that actually, in, you know, consist of the original record rearranged, and that's what re-edits are. Uh, I think the idea is that there's no new elements added. Uh, it's just all, you know, stripping down instruments and changing the order and stretching things out. Um, and uh, this is an example, I'm going to play the... Th uh, the, this is probably one of his most famous realists. I'm going to play the thing that he um, uh, is editing first, the source. And then this is the re-edit. 
So um, I thought both versions have their, uh, their virtues. Um, I thought what's interesting about uh, the two things is you can see it would, it would work even better if I actually played uh, the Stevie Wonder track on vinyl because then it, uh, unfortunately that's like an MP3 on, burned onto a disc. Um, but, but even so, even in that medium, I think you can hear this huge difference between the analog era and the digital era. Um, the original Stevie Wonder recording of Superstition is, is beautifully recorded, but it's designed to be heard as uh, a conjoined entity. Um, you're not really supposed to pick, you know, the, the, the hook that probably most people love is the clavinet line, that sort of percussive melodic keyboard thing. The funk, that's the real funky thing. But you're not really meant to fully pick that out. It's meant to be mushed in tight with the, the drums, the guitar, the bass. It's, um, it's basically an aesthetic that um, was shared by black music and white music at that time, um, what the critic Joe Carducci calls, uh, well, he doesn't call it the jam. The jam is what people at that time, musicians talked about, but he calls it multidimensional simultaneity. Uh, that superheated nexus in performance where each musician, while playing his part in the material, hears and feels and anticipates the greater whole as it is being re reincarnated. So a kind of, um, basically that's, that, that, at that point, black music, white music, soul, funk, rock, were really, really close. And, um, you know, I think Griel Marcus described the super si that track Superstition as a hard rock record that the Stones could have been proud of. You know, even though it's, Nowadays, we would classify it as rhythm and blues. It was, there was much greater proximity between a group like The Meters and Led Zeppelin. You know, they were like, musically, they were very close. Uh, the, the, the Todd Turia um, remix is so digital because it, um, it, it appeals to our digital era desire to kind of separate things. You know, so the, the gain in that is you can hear how great the drum track is and the hi-hats and and you can just pick out the, the decay of the hi-hat sound or the ride cymbal or whatever it is um, on that track. But it's, uh, in the end, it, you know, it does build up gradually uh, until everything is present, I think, by the end of the mix. But, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't have that, that, you know, the jam, the multidimensional simultaneity, the hot tightness uh, of uh, the analog era. Um, and, uh, I thought that was an interesting, um, it showed how, you know, there's this, there's this process that people learn, uh, I think, it, I forget the tame, name for it, it might be articulate listening, but you know, well, like when, you're as, when you're a child, you don't actually separate instruments, and then as you get more and more um, uh, older and a better listener, you can, you know, there's a breakthrough and you can actually hear a bass line as a separate thing. And then gradually, you know, it gets on to the point of people who are like professional musicians and studio engineers, who can't hear, hear music except as separate strands. And the totality of it is, is diminished for them, uh, especially if they worked on the record, but just generally they can pick things apart. Well, I think that's become, in the digital era, that seems to be much more how we listen to music. And so that's what I think that the re-edit re culture reflects that, as well as you know a desire to sort of uh, stretch out the track. I think the re-edit is about 70%, 60% longer than the original song. Um, but um, uh, obviously, also there's an, another element, which is you know that they're, the re-edit, by definition, as an act of editing, uh, is in a supplementary relationship to the precursor, uh, and um, you know, and then that's and Todd Terrier is upfront about that. That part of his what he does, he did, makes his own tracks as well as being the king of re-edits. But you know, his name is the homage to Todd Terry, uh, the, the great New York house uh, DJ who also did a lot of stuff that was kind of hip hop in flavor, like with lots of samples. Um, so I think, you know, um, I think a lot of, a lot of what, uh, a lot of what recreativity is really, it's about editing, you know, it's, you know, and editing is a, you know, a, is a great skill and a, uh, an important thing. And I've actually been an editor of, for a year, and I, I know that it can make a big difference to the end product, but there is a sort of priority, which is without writers, editors don't have anything to work on. 
And, and I think, you know, I think that's what the real creativity discourse kind of, um, you know, uh, diminishes that fact uh, in some ways. Um, now, um, one thing that, uh, uh, one term that I came up with when I was writing this book uh, was um, hyperstasis, which is, um, uh, it refers, to, it was particularly provoked by dance music, um, but I think it fits music in general, maybe even culture in general. Um, and I, th I think uh, what it refers to really is sort of like how there's a kind of high turnover of, of micro styles or micro genres, um, but not the sense of these huge advances, these huge stylistic leaps, like where a whole new field of uh, culture comes into being, like hip hop or rave or whatever. Um, and I think, I think hyperstasis is actually a sort of uh, a kind of integral part of uh, what happens to culture after a long, after uh, actually it's a sort of inevitable result after a period of innovation. Uh, like if you have a period of relentless kind of rapid fire innovation, a lot of styles are, uh, are generated uh, and they're kind of run through really quickly almost before all their potential is exhausted. And what happens is there's an accumulation of material uh, that's left, and it almost kind of demands and invites retrospection. It's almost irresistible at a certain point for artists to start looking back and thinking, well, there's actually more we could get out of this obsolete style that we've, this past moment in music that we've kind of passed by, you know, passed over too quickly. And then you enter this, this you know, one of the hallmarks of an era of hyperstasis is um, old styles are revisited and sort of tinkered with. And, and tinkered, I don't know what the French word is, but tinkered, tinkered they translated as tinkered. This is a term you get a lot in the writing of Nicolas Bouriard, and he, it's, it's a sort of word he's trying to positivize, you know, because tinker, certainly in English, um, is a kind of, uh, has become a kind of derogatory word. It, it, me it originally meant uh, sort of minor repairs and customization, and has since come to mean, you know, fairly insignificant activity. Um, and then another technique as well as tinkering with these these sort of established styles is um, recombining two styles to form a kind of culture, a uh, kind of hybrid. Um, and I think these 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 sort of modes become more and more. Uh, tempting and more and more uh, easy, I suppose, you know, than, than trying to innovate when you have a cultural feel that's sort of kind of been, uh, a lot of the options have already been explored, you know, like it's like a page of white paper, uh, a piece of white paper that's kind of been drawn on and there aren't many white spots left. Um, and, and obviously, you know, quite a lot of, um, Good and sometimes even great work can come from these processes. I, I think of, uh, you know, in, in the last decade, one of my favourite musicians, Ariel Pink, is, is someone who, who does who does that a lot. His, his music's based on classic rock and uh, sort of radio rock from the 70s and MTV 80s type pop. Um, uh, you can see uh, uh, an earlier figure like Elvis Costello as, as being uh, doing this. You know. Perhaps lyrically he maybe is an innovator, but musically it's very recombinant. You know, he, he sometimes he is inspired by, you know, one of his albums, Armed Forces. You know, he'd been listening to a lot of ABBA, but, you know, usually it was much older. Uh, you know, it wasn't recent things that inspired him. It was, he would do an album in the style of um, 60s soul, you know, uh, or he'd do a record like Almost Blue that was like... Um, Almost curatorial in the sense that he was uh, you know, he was doing all these covers of country music and he was making an argument at a time where most rock fans considered uh, country music to be sort of redneck music or very sentimental and worthless. He was saying, "No, no, this is this is white soul, basically." You know, so that was an, an interesting uh, gesture. I think the problem with these these sort of careers that don't have a kind of um, a kind of internal evolution. Is that the, uh, is that um, 
well, it does, it, it, there's less of a sense that you're going some, the artist is going anywhere. Uh, and also, if you have a lot of influences passing through you in this way, then it becomes um, less likely that you'll have a defined musical identity uh, and therefore you won't be actually yourself be able to be an influence on others. It's hard to imagine. Ariel Pink has had an influence on quite a lot of uh, current bands who basically done the same thing as him, but it's difficult to see someone in 20 or 30 years going back and doing uh, music inspired by Ariel Pink in the way that Ariel Pink has done music inspired by, well, everyone from Fleetwood Mac to Public Image Limit, Limited. Um, and then on a larger level, I think the problem with this sort of, this orientation towards the archive of music history, you know, the, what I'm calling the Ariel Pink, the Elvis Costello approach, is that it leads to a kind of, um, uh, when more and more people are doing that, then the music culture has a kind of disparate quality uh, because simply because you know you have this big archive that now spans so many decades, um, there's a lot of past to draw on. So that leads to a, a huge array of a diversity of, of uh, styles that are more or less derivative. Um, and if you look at back, back at the history of music uh, at the periods that are considered, you know, have come down to history as dynamic and and glorious or golden. There might be a lot of influences flying back and forth, but it's all happening in real time. You know, in the 60s, uh, white and black music were inspiring each other, and all the leading bands of that era were competing to get uh, further into the future. In the post-punk era, um, you know, a lot of the, the groups in, uh, in uh, the sort of white groups, the white experimental groups, were actually picking up on on brand new or very recent innovations in funk, disco, reggae, uh, later on hip hop and African music. Um, and I think similar stuff goes on in the 90s, you know, because, because you had the, uh, the influence of techno and rave, it, it was uh, inspiring a lot of groups from Manchester groups like the Stone Roses to people like Bjork to the whole post rock scene. They were very much fired up on these ideas coming out of house and techno and hip hop. Uh, I think if the archive draws the energy of new bands away from the present, what happens is that uh, the music scene you know, falls into a state of, uh, uh, it becomes desynchronized. You know, it's, it's no longer in any kind of synchrony. There's no pulse, there's no kind of geist to the, the zeitgeist. Um, and actually, this is a, Nicholas Buriad talks about this in his very interesting book, The Radigan. He talks about, he calls it heterochronic, so a sense of, multiple different timelines and, and temporalities coexisting. Um, and although I you know, disagree with his book a lot, I think it's really super perceptive. Uh, one thing he talks about is, um, you know, he, he talks about fashion in the modern era, and he says, you know, it's no longer, you no longer get these sort of big waves, these big waves where everyone looks the same, or uh, ev everyone's skirts are the same length, or hair is all the same. Um, like, for instance, when Osama bin Laden was shot uh, a photograph circulated uh, of him and his whole extended family from the 70s. And they all look so 70s. They've all got like f flares and longish hair and, you know, and the colors are all of that period. I don't think you could you do that now. I don't think any given family, you could have that kind of um, look that relates it to a, a time. Um, uh, and he, so, you know, Buriad talks, he says, you know, there are no longer waves, but, you know, wavelets, like tiny waves, basically. And that, to me, made me think of um, this thing that maybe you, some of you might have done as well as, a, as uh, when you were children in a swimming pool, um, where you can cling to the side of the swimming pool and you kind of move your bodies in sync. And then that creates these big waves that kind of splash the other swimmers. But then when you stop doing that, um, the pool kind of reverts to its normal state, which is this sort of omnidirectional chaos of little tiny waves. And that to me, you know, is a visual image for hyperstasis, you know, uh, which is all these different waves, none of them actually converging, uh, these sort of small waves that none of them really ever amount to uh, a wave, let alone a tsunami, you know, and a tsunami in music terms would be punk rock, it would be hip-hop, it would be a rave, it would be these tremendous co convergences of energy 
uh, that at the extreme, you know, not only seemed to be musically revolutionary, but actually seemed to have some kind of political weight behind them as well, some kind of force. Um, and in fact, so what I'm re you know talking about really is the power of groupthink and present-mindedness, you know, synchrony, uh, a culture that has these strong energy centers of innovation leading to a kind of uh, a sort of dynamic cultural field. Um, another, you know, another, another thing that is, uh, I think, is uh, another reason why I like to sort of keep on believing the idea of innovation is that actually um, innovators are good because they provide people with things to copy and to, to rip off, you know. Uh, um, and you see that all the time in, in music. Um, you know, you can, not everyone can be an innovator, but you can copy from something innovative. And, uh, and if you do it in real time, what you get is this, you know, you get, you get, you get eras that have a feel and have, a, uh, and have an exciting sound. All the groups that try to sound like the Beatles or the Birds, you know, or um, in 90s techno, you know, uh, you had a track like Mentasm or Energy Flash by Joey Beltram, and then you ended up with a thousand other songs like that, and it makes it makes a very strong scene. It makes you know it makes for a, a sense of uh, momentum and a kind of uh, intensity when something is so strong and so uh, powerful that everyone wants to partake of it. And you know the same thing happened in uh, R&B in the 90s when Timberland came up with all these innovations that were copied by other producers, and you know it was exciting. The whole radio had this new sound on it. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, you know, my other sort of feeling of, of not wanting to go along with the re-creativity idea is that I just kind of help, help feeling that it's kind of uh, parasitic, you know, it's kind of, it's not contributing much. Um, there's this group in Britain called The Horrors, um, and uh, they've done these albums, uh, each album is like sev heavily kind of oriented to a set of influences, and um, it's very sort of clearly signpost what they are as well. You can you can tell what they are, and um, uh, on their latest record, Skying, the signposts. Um, they've, in the past, they've been influenced by I don't know, goth and psychedelia and crowd rock, and now on their latest record, Skying, it's uh, Manchester groups from the very end of the 80s, like Stone Roses. It's Duran Duran, Simple Minds, Jesus Joan, it's even Britpop. Uh, is an influence on this record. Um, and um, a journalist called Charles Ravens, um, who's a fan of them, uh, reviewed uh, Skying, and uh, did a very interesting review, I thought. Um, uh, very well argued, uh, although I disagreed with it. But she said, you know, she said that they, horrors di did belong to a genre, and she said the genre was the past. Uh, but she said that wasn't the problem. Um, and, uh, you know, because they were creating something rich and distinctive out of all this sort of wealth they drew on. And uh, her, f her final sort of uh, flourish of rhetoric at the end was, uh, the past is ours for the reaping. Uh, which, you know, is fine, but, you know, there's simple agricultural common sense wisdom, which is that you don't just reap, you plant seeds for a future harvest. Uh, and it's all very well, the horrors, you know, harvesting all these brilliant ideas that, that predecessors have brought into being and developed and perfected. But what, are, you know, what is a band like the Horrors actually you know, laying down that others in the future uh, will be inspired by and want to draw on? Um, and you know, uh, I think it's parasitic because you're taking advantage of other people's labor. Um, you've, you've skipped the, the hard work and the struggle to create new forms. And you know, it may not even be an individual artist who creates a new form. You know, often it's a collective struggle. So if you took at someone like Adele, uh, she is uh, adopting something that emerged from an African American community over a long period of time for all kinds of reasons. Um, uh, and sort of uh, doing it sort of out of any sequence or relation to the present. You know, it doesn't relate, it's nothing to do with what black music is now. In fact, it's actually the opposite of it because it's very, uh, um, it's an old language of, of, of love and, uh, 
it's soul, right? Whereas uh, modern R and B is much more about uh, sex, I suppose. Um, and uh, I think you know, if you are going to adopt an achieved an achieved form wholesale, you really have to make sure that you bring something new to it. Um, so how would you? How do you? Uh, what are the ways that people do that? Um, at the end of uh, the, the, I mentioned Jim Jarmusch's manifesto about stealing from everywhere, uh, and he he quotes uh, Jean Luc Godard at the end and says, "It's not where you take things, where you take things from; it's where you take them to." Ezra Pound like likewise uh, urged artists to make it new, um, but as as people have pointed out. Um, Louis Menand, the critic, uh, points out that you know, the it in Make It New is the old. It's what's valuable in the culture of the past. And Pound actually did quite a bit of quotation and allusion uh, and translation in his poetry. I think the crucial word, though, is translation. Um, and uh, in fact, mistranslation may be even better. And in the pre digital era, you know, the analog era, musicians often might have started with the intent to copy and to imitate, but just were simply not able to duplicate the sound and the rhythmic feel of their sources. So in post-punk, for instance, um, an awful lot of bands wanted to sound like uh, Nile Rogers in Chic, the, his guitar sound, but they didn't have the technical skill, they didn't have the, the, you know, the deep grounding in black musical traditions. So they produced something that actually was kind of, on one level, uh, a mistranslation or a travesty of Chic, uh, but it, in the process, it became something new. Um, and often, it, you know, I think it's the less skilled musicians who, who produce these musical breakthroughs uh, by getting things wrong. Whereas if you look at session musicians as a, as a class, they don't tend to produce innovations uh, because they know how to do things the right way. Uh, and when they do, uh, when they are involved in innovative projects, it's usually when someone else is in control of them, you know, a, a producer, with some kind of visionary idea, or uh, you know, a non-musician like Eno, who got a lot of progressive rock musicians who were super skilled to do things they never would have thought of. You know, so it's someone like that who enables the session musician or the super skilled musician to think outside this box that they've built around themselves with technique. Um, and you could also have a, a conscious and deliberate strategy of uh, getting it wrong. Or doing it uh, in a sort of damaged way. Uh, that was a, an ethos that was very big in post punk. Um, uh, the group Wire would set themselves tasks. You know, they would say like, uh, "Let's rewrite uh, Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good, but let's just use one chord." And as a result, you end up with a song that doesn't. Um, I forget which one it is now, but the song doesn't sound anything like Chuck Berry. You would never think Johnny Be Good or Chuck Berry when you hear it. Um, I think the trouble with the digital era, though, is that it's actually much easier to get exactly the sound you want. You know, um, you, um, and also there's just a lot more information now as well. Like, you know, there's been a lot of um, books and magazine articles in te technical magazines, musician magazines, that go into real detail about the drum sounds on certain records and the studio engineering and so forth. And you know, the things like uh, not only um, uh, George Martin has written a book about being the producer of the Beatles, but the Jeff Emmerich, who was the studio engineer of the Beatles records, he has written a book as well. So there's all this information out there that people can draw on. Um, another form of translation is uh, is between art forms. Um, the British broadcaster and writer Alan Partridge, uh, discussing his memoir, says, a true writer, a good writer, refuses to be influenced by any other writer. It's cheating otherwise. But then he talks about how uh, my influences come from elsewhere. I'm inspired by the chord choices of Sting, the camera angles of Scorsese. And there's actually a, an example of that in post-punk. Well, there's many examples of it, actually. But one that I specifically thought of is a gang of four um, wrote one song called Love Like Anthrax. And they actually modeled it on, they were big fans of uh, avant-garde movies. And they modeled it on a. Uh, a Goddard movie called uh, Numero Deux that has a kind of split screen thing in it where you have different sets of action. They made a split screen song with uh, a vocal coming out of one speaker 
singing and a voice speaking a text and the other speaker. Um, I mentioned Alan Partridge. He's not a real person, of course. He's a fictional comic character created by uh, the actor Steve Coogan. And uh, Steve Coogan uh, recently uh, did this movie, The Trip. Um, and he and his, uh, another comic actor, Rob Ryan, are going on a trip of northern England and they're, they're writing a travel piece about restaurants. And uh, Bryden suggests um, an idea of how, to, he, how Coogan could write the piece, a format for it. And Coogan objects uh, dismissively, and he says, uh, it's been done. And Rob Bryden says, um, it's 2010. Everything's been done before. All you can do is do something someone's done before, but do it better or differently. Um, Coogan says, uh, to some extent, that's correct. And I think, so the idea here is, is um, not it's not just that there's nothing new under the sun, under the sun you know, which comes from the Bible, Ecclesiastes, uh, but that there will never be again anything new under the sun. And I find that uh, very hard to believe. But I think the key word in, in what Rob Bryden said is, is differently. And he says, do it better or do it, dif- or do it differently. And that differently seems to correspond to uh, Goddard's um, where you take it to. Uh, or Ezra Pound's new in Make It New. And I think part of the problem as well is that music critics have got very bad at pinpointing, at pointing to this differently bit, the, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the, the where to uh, bit that is actually new. Uh, it's quite hard to do that, you know, it's hard, it's hard work to do that. And often critics, including myself, uh, going in for this easier option, which is, you know, you explain something in terms of its precedents and its sources and its reference points. You situate the artist uh, in a, a sort of map uh, of the past. Uh, I can remember times when, um, when, it was, when it was actually impossible to do that because the map uh, didn't apply. You know, there, there have been musical moments when you had to sort of you couldn't do the reference game. You could just you had to come up with new terms and concepts, particularly in the 90s in in jungle and electronic music. Um, it just seemed to demand new language, and and neologisms, you know, like words you just invented. Um, but nowadays it's 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 very easy to I think to reel out reference points. Um, here's an example: um, a review of Maya Hawthorne's record. How do you do? And the critic goes. Uh, Maybe most engaging is Hawthorne's sense of scope. He's, ju- he's, just, he's, just, he's not just pulling from classic 60s and 70s Motown and Philadelphia international sides, but also from the rock and pop records they share the charts with. Dreaming fits on a power pop continuum somewhere between Solo McCartney and Peak ELO. That's a very small gap, I think, between Solo McCartney and Peak ELO. Uh, a, long, a long time and finally falling divides Steely, Steely Dan by Hall & Oates. Uh, and no string plays out like, like TK record style disco run through a Stevie Wonder filter. Uh, but this isn't an ossified, stuck in the past affair, he says. But in the review, there's nothing at all that's been said that would justify this closing assertion that the record isn't stuck in the past. Everything that's said about it serves to pin it to the past more firmly. And in the, in the end, the re- review is just basically praising uh, Hawthorne for being uh, diverse uh, in his derivativeness. Um, so I feel there's almost kind of like a, a critical responsibility not to make it new, but, uh, but to emphasize the new, even at the risk of making out it's newer than it is. Um, but, you know, it, in, a, in a culture where... Uh, uh, creatives are more and more often recreatives. It's hard to point out that that element of newness. One of the people who's been um, very vocal and eloquent in in talking about uh, uh, recreativity as a good thing is uh, the science fiction writer William Gibson, and he he's been he's the person who coined this term, or certainly has been using this term. Uh, a temporality, uh, you know, the, the idea that of 
the notion of the future is old fashioned and we live in this sort of eternal network present. Um, he's, he's glad about the state of affairs and he, you know, he, he, a few years ago, he, 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 via Twitter, he sent out a, a sort of uh, a series of statements and thoughts and uh, aphorisms on, uh, on this topic. And one of them particularly kind of uh, hit me hard. Uh, he, says, um, uh, he says, very creative people get atemporal early on, are, v are relatively unimpressed by the now factor, by latest things. Less creative people believe in originality and innovation, two basically misleading but culturally very powerful concepts. Well, I felt crushed. Um, <laughs> I felt crushed by that. That's me, I'm less creative. Still believing in originality and innovation. But then I thought about it and I thought, what is creativity without either the concept of innovation or the concept of originality? What would it actually consist of? And then the other thing that struck me about Gibson's tweet is, you know, he says, he, talk, he describes innovation and originality as uh, misleading but culturally very powerful concepts. And I had to agree with that. I think they're very, they're very powerful concepts and they've underwritten, um, you know, Maybe they're delusions, but they've underwritten the most dynamic eras of music, you know, you know, the 60s, the post-punk era, uh, the rave 1990s. And perhaps, you know, perhaps we should, perhaps more of us should be misled, you know, perhaps we should re-embrace the false consciousness. Because, uh, uh, you know, if you believe in the possibility of innovation, it seems to me you are more likely to try for it and then more likely to succeed. Uh, so my final thought, uh, or hope at least, is that uh, innovation and originality uh, continue to be self-fulfilling fallacies. Thank you. Um, thank you very, very much for your talk, Simon. Um, we can open up for a few questions, um, not too many, because we've been going on for quite some time now, uh, and I see some people are leaving. But um, if anyone wants to uh, ask some questions, um, I will give you the microphone so um, everyone can hear the question. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, was there some kind of a trigger moment for you when you just when you went? That's it. I'm writing a book called uh, Retromania. <laughs> uh, um, there wasn't really it's something that actually when I when I started working on the book and I sort of looked at uh, uh, talking of <laughs> talking of uh, um, copying and uh, sampling. I you know uh, as a writer. Uh, I sometimes uh, copy myself, and I went through my old articles looking for good lines to use, uh, and, and or thoughts I'd had in the past on, on this topic. And I was surprised how early I'd actually been worrying about retro, and I even it even cropped up in something I wrote in the mid '80s, um, more about that. Um, that was when that was the very first time that reissuing really started to take off, and I made some comment about it. But you know, re really since since the the 90s, it's cropped up quite, early 90s, it's cropped up quite regularly as something I've thought about. You know, I, I came up with this term record collection rock in the early 90s um, to describe a bunch of bands that seemed to sort of, you could just see what their record collection was from their music, even if they didn't talk about it, which they did in interviews, that's all they talked about. They didn't, it was so different from um, in the post-punk era, people didn't really talk about didn't talk much about their influences. They were more, more likely to talk about politics, or um, maybe if they did talk about art, it would be films or books that inspire them, or things like that. But um, no, it's something that's haunted me for a long while. But in terms of just whether feeling like um, feeling like there was a book there, it was really like uh, a bunch of things that happened in the sort of 2006, 2007. Um, there was, I really noticed this phenomenon of the, um, I don't know if you have it here, but uh, the, 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 it was started by this, uh, this promoter called All Tomorrow's Parties, and they did these events called Don't Look Back, where a band plays its whole album all the way through from track one to track 14. And that, 
that was very successful and it was copied hugely. Um, like it seems like almost everyone's, anyone who's done an album that anyone feels fond towards or respects or admires, it, it seems like they've done it. And, um, and so I really noticed that. That seemed like significant. That seemed to say something about our time in some way. Um, and then another one was actually uh, the, the remix album uh, that the George Martin and his son did of the Beatles, Love. I thought that was really significant. I actually thought that would be a trend. I thought everyone would do that. There would be The Who would have a remix album. And, and it didn't quite escalate, but it still struck me as a very interesting thing that a band is, you know, super respected and worshipped as the Beatles um, would have a kind of mashup album done of them. Um, and then, you know, officially, not, not people are doing that for fun, that kind of thing. And Danger Mouse did the White Album combined with Jay-Z's Black Album to make the Grey Album. But, you know, this was an official release uh, uh, done as the Beatles. Um, but then the other thing, that was actually the things that I liked as well that, that kind of made me think about this, because the, I mentioned Ariel Pink, and the, there were a lot of um, groups that I like, that made music that was very much bound up with memory and the past, nostalgia. Uh, uh, Ariel Pink's music particularly used sort of techniques to kind of sound like a, a faded memory, like, you know, like a, a tape that was wearing out. Uh, and so it was right there in the music itself was almost like this, well, kind of like hipstamatic or Instagram, a kind of a, a sonic effect of aging and, and of the medium of recording somehow decaying. And there, were, there was a bunch of groups in Britain who were doing that called uh, a label called Ghost Box and various other people who all seem to be on this sort of um, nostalgia, memory, you know. And the fact that I really enjoyed this music, you know, was, made it complex because um, uh, I'm quite a nostalgic person in lots of ways and I actually enjoy, uh, you know, old pop culture. I, I listen to a lot of old music, you know. Um, uh, and uh, it's not that I don't think people should listen to old music, it's, just, it's when bands sort of cop replicate it very closely that I feel like it's a kind of dead end or something. So yeah, there was multiple causes. <laughs> there was one more question back here. Uh, thank you for extremely rich and uh, well. I haven't read your book, so it was very uh, provoking, thought-provoking. Um, but but none of that is in the book, actually. That's the, okay, that's the annoying thing. It's, it's, it's that I wish I had done a chapter uh, on this. I hadn't realised it. it was such a I hadn't realised it was such a developed um, argument until I started getting reviews, and then I sort of followed the trail leading me to these people. Uh, and it's quite. A, I talk about mashups in the book, but I don't really. The the, the people, the literary critics, I don't. I, I wasn't aware they were mm. doing this stuff. Right, so. because well, I, I I come from literature myself, so and I'm right now working with archives. So I think your way of working with these uh, medial um, surroundings for for creativity is is, is really uh, interesting and and uh, to the point. Uh, but I was uh, missing in your talk some sort of uh, well, at least a reference to Michel Foucault the 20th century greatest theorists on archives. Right. Uh, and also, uh, perhaps uh, one of the, well, uh, if not the, the, the originator, but one of the fathers of the discourse of what you might call recreativity with the idea of uh, what does it matter, who is speaking, someone said. Right. Um, so, so that was just that I Actually, I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of Foucault. I never, th I never thought of that. I, he's actually one of those, most authors, are tend to have read one or two things by them, but I've actually read quite a lot of his things. And I actually read The Archaeology of Knowledge when I was uh, a student in my, in, uh, when I had this summer job in a factory, and then it, during the breaks I would read The Archaeology of Knowledge. But um, is that the key text for that? For uh, the yeah, uh, right. what's an author? What's an author? Yeah, that's the, that's the, the I don't main I don't argument with originality. It's a very but then he's, he's like the the topic you mentioned from uh, uh, yeah. Nicolas Bourriaud, uh, the heterochronies, yeah. uh, or heterochronies. Is that taken from Foucault? That's also from Foucault oh, right. uh, in his writing on archives. So that's it's extremely yeah. important. 
Uh, yeah, I didn't, you know, I've, I read that, the archaeology and knowledge, and I can't remember anything about it except that there's this amazing dialogue at the end where um, it's like Foucault uh, arguing with a humanist, isn't it? And he yeah, sort of, yeah. it's just fantastically brilliant. And it ends with this amazingly thing at the end where, yeah, it's basically saying like, uh, we're, yeah, language is authorless and we're all going to die and humanity will disappear and none of this will be remembered. Well, it's incredibly nihilistic and uh, exciting to read. Uh, <laughs> is it, that's uh, more or less right, right? Uh, well, yeah. Some, some... Yeah, but can, well, why don't, do you want to explain why, what he... Well, he, he, uh, he um, tries to, to develop the, the idea of the archive as something very uh, productive, something, a, a place where uh, ideas and times ex coexist side right. by side. So he's actually uh, mapping out the era we are living in right. um, about this, uh, this easily accessible uh, right. archive that the internet is. So I think that, I mean, that's just really important. Well, but what, what, what my question was, oh, that, right. that was really just a comment. What my question was uh, is um, your idea of, of the creativity and originality and these yeah. being uh, misconceptions perhaps, but you want them to be around, okay, I, I, I get that. But I'm, I'm wondering, what, what do they mean? Because you uh, discussed recreativity as something uh, popping up in a very historically defined era, mm. but originality and creativity are also concepts from yeah. a historical period, somewhere around 1750 and onwards. So how do you uh, relate to that? Well, it, it's totally true, isn't it? That um, yeah, they're, rel they're relatively recent inventions, and um, I think in the in the book I have uh, I cite a few examples of people who, um, like Sherry Levine, I think uh, said in one of her document, one of her uh, manifestos or interviews or something, she basically said, you know, um, well, in outside the West, copying as a concept doesn't exist because everyone copies, and in the especially in Eastern cultures, that's how you become, you, you rise to the level of competence, is by imitative work. Um, and uh, uh, and then, then I've, uh, there's this uh, anthropologist friend of mine, uh, Wendy Fonero, who's written uh, really cool stuff about indie rock culture, but in one of the pieces she wrote in The Guardian, I think it was, where she's, she's called The Indie Professor, I think she. I think it's th that's where I came across. It. She talks about how, in certain, uh, there's a, na a particular Native American tribe where, um, uh, yeah, it's, she basically she puts it really f in a fun way. She says something like, um, uh, "You're not supposed to change songs at all. You do them exactly how they're supposed to be done. These traditional songs." And and she says something like, "New new songs are not welcomed, basically." You know, there's there's no calling in this culture. There's no calling to generate new songs, and you don't, and you try and do them exactly as you can, uh, as the way they've always been done. You know, and there's and there's loads of you know. So it's a it's a Western yeah. Originality and innovation are, are Western ideas uh, that are, and I think in the mid Middle Ages, right, and and before the, the modern era, in the West, you know, people copied. Copying was what you did, right. Uh, and it was also very connected to technology. Seventeen yeah? fifties. Yeah. This is right off, right after the printing press becomes full go. Uh, right. uh, it comes all, all over. So it's th these ideas is, they're very connected to, te to the technology. Uh, so I, I think I think the beginning of your project is really interesting. But the mm. the the whole argument with the recreativity is well yeah. Well, that's well more difficult. Th they're sort of. Uh, they're sort of uh, enthusiastically, uh, I guess they're enthusiastic about a return to how things always were before or something. Is that, uh, I don't know. Um, I think the, the, the digital uh, nature of it uh, changes it just because it's so easy to copy things exactly. I mean, you're lit it's literally the same. There's no, there isn't that sort of, uh, you know, there isn't a, uh, as much space for a kind of um, an accidental change. 
I mean, like I dare say, in the in the in the in the, in the Native American culture, where songs are and new songs are not encouraged, and you do the old ones how they how they should be done. Gradually over time, the songs do change just because uh, that's the way things have. Evolve even as, as as hard as anyone tries to be faithful to a blueprint, uh, human error creeps in. But I think uh, with uh, or you know just things shift. Just the way if you look at the way language changes uh, and the way uh, uh, you know the difference between Shakespeare in English and uh, current English, or the way accents change. You know there, there are these there are these impersonal processes of change. Um, uh, but I think there's something much more. Uh, but digital techniques are much more like replication, aren't they? They're much more like cloning. I think there's something kind of uh, uh, as a kind of perfection and an absolute fidelity that seems to me more integral to the digital technology. I don't know. I don't know if that is relevant. <laughs> One last question. Yeah, there, there was a, a text that was written in the late 90s by Arthur Croker, a Canadian cultural theorist, which he called Remake Millennium, where he mm. claimed that uh, the 2000s were essentially going to be an era that was about uh, recombination, remake, reprocessing, and he connected that to a generalized political, social, and economic malaise in Western mm. culture, that uh, th the loss of belief in any form of progress within social and industrial production would en inevitably lead to a stagnation in culture. Do you, mm. do you think that's too pessimistic, or could it be uh, true? Uh, it does seem like that sometimes, doesn't it? Yes. No, I mean, I think um, that's something in my book I, I, uh, I don't go too much into that, but it's come up in interviews, and 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 people have said, uh, it you know, uh, and I've talked more about you know this idea that it's harder to imagine the future. It's harder to imagine the future that's better, an improvement, uh, and that perhaps encourages people to, th you know, you can sort of see why people would be so romantically attached or attracted to. The 60s, or punk and post-punk, or even now you have people like there's this whole thing. I was going to mention it, but I sped up a bit because I till I'd gone on a bit long. Um, there's this thing uh, people are calling it hipster house, um, but it's basically like a bunch of people who've come out of indie culture and and a noise scene, and they're making sort of house music now, and it's sort of very closely modelled on Chicago in the late 80s and Detroit and you know New York in the late 80s and it's very faithful to that sound and and that's another era that also now seems romantic um, and uh, and has a certain glory to it and people can look on YouTube and actually find clips of very badly filmed clips of people dancing so they you know, they can learn how to do the moves and you know um, there's a club in I think it's in Chicago or maybe San Francisco where they've um, you know, their flyers deliberately use the same kind of typography that was used at uh, Hacienda in Manchester in the late 80s. You know, it's all very faithful to the details. All the details are there to be copied. You can use to get the f fonts and you can make things that look like those sort of really primitive photoshopped rave flyers um, from the early 90s. You know, you can go to some trouble to get that sort of crapness. Um, and uh, so, you know, I can see what, sorry, I've strayed from your point. I always go back to music somehow, I don't know what, but, um, uh, you know, so that's another era that's come up as can be seen, can be construed as more fun, dynamic, optimistic, innocent than the present. You know, there's lots, uh, there's plenty of things about now and plenty of things about the, how things have been all the last, ever since the year 2000, really, that would totally encourage uh, people to look at other eras as being having been better, even though often during those eras people were complaining and moaning. I mean, I seem to remember uh, a lot of the time in the 90s there were a lot of things to, even though there was like rave and stuff like that, there were a lot of bad things going on, you know, and uh, it seemed like things were getting, the economy was bad a lot of the time and stuff. But you know, there's definitely it's, it's been a really bad, really tough. Uh, 
period, hasn't it, the last 10 years, um, economically, politically. Um, but he predicted, he predicted that, did he? He, he was, when did he write that? Was it like, all oh, right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. He's a very interesting writer, Arthur Crook. He wrote a really, I, I can't remember the title of it, but he wrote a whole book that was about sampling, and it was very, um, you know, interesting uh, talking about, um, uh, he talked about uh, sampling as a kind of archiving of body parts in the sense that, you know, it's actual physical human labor that made these sounds, and you, they're all archived, and um, you can just pull them down and reactivate them and change them around. And um, I think I think there's some. I remember putting this on my website. I used to operate. I had a thing called a rave theory toolkit, which was all the quotes I couldn't use in uh, in my book Energy Flash, um, but things I found in theory texts that seemed to fit. You know, GABA or ecstasy or all these rave things. I just put them all up on the web, and one of them was this great quote from Arthur Croker that was, he talked about, he said something like, ours is a time of non-history uh, based around the spectacular flare-out of all the energy of other eras. You know, that is archived in this form of, you know, samples, and um, so you can extract all this energy from other eras and just sort of release it in this giant flare-out of energy. Uh, which I really struck me as interesting uh, especially in the context of, I think you wrote that during the height of rave culture, and so much of rave culture uh, did involve, you know, um, some of it was done without sampling, but there was a lot of, particularly the stuff I thought was most interesting was was largely based on sampling and, and sort of getting things that have been played by humans to go into patterns that were beyond being played by a human being. And, and uh, like jungle music, it was just like, it, it, it was sort of this, uh, disturbing blend of the machine and the, the human and the you know things that were gritty and earthy and and uh, from this analog era but sort of uh, turned into this kind of digital magic um, yeah I think he's a, he's a really interesting writer croker okay um, I think we will uh wrap it up here and uh, continue the con conversations uh, between us. And um, I just want to thank you again, Simon Reynolds, thank for you. coming to Bergen Kunsthal and to thank all of you for coming tonight. <laughs>